Amen. Aren't you glad for the touch of the Master's hand? This morning, have your Bibles open to Genesis chapter number 37. Genesis 37. Knowing the sermon and hearing the songs this morning and see the Lord preparing for us what He has. I want to look at in Genesis 37 as we look at the life of Joseph. One of the most familiar parts to the life of Joseph. It's the part where his brothers sold him in the hand of slave traders. A part of the story that is not pleasant, not happy. Sometimes when we read in the Bible or know Bible characters, we fast forward to the end of the story. Some of you do this with perhaps movies or books. You find out what's going to happen at the end and then you can handle the process. At least there's one honest person in here. And sometimes with Bible characters you do the same thing. We say, oh well, at the end of the story, Joseph had it all. At the end of the story, Joseph, second ruler in the country of Egypt, at the end of the story, he was blessed beyond measure financially and with authority and with prestige and honor and fame. Yet we miss the steps. What God propped them through, what God took them through, and somehow it seems then that they're not relatable. Somehow it seems like, wow, Joseph, there's nothing that happened to him that could happen to me. And as I begin to study the life of Joseph, you've noticed in the sermons, I've really focused on the in spite of parts of Joseph's story. We know the ending. We know what happens, how God blessed him at the end. But have you ever stopped to consider all the in spite ofs that Joseph has had and had to face back then? Genesis chapter 37. I'd like to draw your attention just for a brief portion of Scripture beginning in the middle of verse number 17. But the Bible says in the middle of verse 17 of Genesis 37, And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. And when they, his brothers, saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him and cast him into some pit. And we will say, Some evil beast hath devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. And Reuben heard it. And he delivered him out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. And it came to pass, when Joseph was coming to his brethren, that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. And they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty, there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat bread. And they lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead, with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brethren were content. And then there passed by Midianites mer merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph into Egypt. Lord, I thank you for this time that we have this morning. Lord, I need your help. I need your strength. I need your wisdom. Lord, I don't know all the needs that someone may have who's here under the sound of my voice, either online or in the auditorium this morning, but Lord, you do. Lord, you know that it was time to preach this passage of Scripture. And I pray and ask that you would guide and direct us this morning. Lord, may your Holy Spirit meet and minister to our hearts. Would you make it plain for us today? Lord, if there's someone here who's dealing with hurt and rejection, would they learn and lean on you and trust you? Lord, for you with your master's touch can make all things to be good. Lord, we sure love you. Bless this time now in Jesus' name. Amen. You ever felt 
any rejection in your life? You ever felt any hurt in your life? I think if we're honest, we could spend a few hours talking about the hurt that we faced. And there are different levels of hurt and rejection. Sometimes someone will get passed over for a job promotion. Knowing full well maybe that they were well qualified to have that job and they feel hurt and rejection and maybe even betrayal. Other times it happens inside of a friendship. And two friends who are so close that all of a sudden a situation will arise, a misunderstanding and now one friend is angry at the other and there's hurt and rejection. But it seems as if those pale in comparison to when someone faces hurt and rejection from their own family. It seems like a job position and a friendship, though painful and, and can bring some, some hurt and some anxiety in life, pales in comparison to when it happens inside of a, a home. Sometimes it's a husband and a wife. Sometimes rejection comes in the form of betrayal. Sometimes ending in divorce and there's rejection and hurt. Sometimes it's with a child who has been placed for adoption from a, from a mother, a single mother. And later on they answer the question, why didn't my mom want me? Rejection and hurt. Sometimes it's from family strife and I've seen it happen over silly things like money. For money. You'll see it uh, after a death in the family that money can cause a family who was close to be full of rejection and hurt and strife. And it seems like that, that the, the job passing over and the friendship pale in comparison to when hurt and rejection comes from inside those we love the most. Sometimes it's come in the form of actions that have been done to someone else. Rejection and hurt. And the question I ask you this morning is, how have you or how will you respond when you're dealt the hand of rejection and hurt? You see, sometimes when pet agony or pain comes into our life, it's because of our own choices. If I swing a hammer and I miss and I hit my thumb, I would like to blame the hammer, but let's be honest, it's my fault. The other day I was driving downtown line. You may or may not have noticed that there's a lot of deer out right now. You also may, should be aware there's one less deer in Saginaw County than there was last week. I just hung up the phone with my wife and talking to her, she was headed home, I was headed home, it was after dark, and she said, whoa, there's three deer on the road, honey, there sure are a lot of deer out there, and I said, absolutely there are. I hung up the phone, I had no sooner hung up the phone than three deer decided to frolic in the middle of the road. Where there were three, now there are two. <laughs> you say, how was your truck? It's fine. Nothing that a little, uh, a little uh, money can't fix a little bumper. I was blessed, all right? And sometimes uh, the pain and agony comes because it's my fault or your fault. And it may be frustrated or, or whatever, but it's, it's fine, right? We can, we can walk through that. But sometimes, sometimes the pain or rejection and hurt comes when it's not our fault. When we really have done nothing literally nothing to deserve it. How do we respond then? If you look in Genesis chapter 37 this morning, I want to kind of go through the chapter and kind of break down some elements of this rejection and hurt. I think some elements, some details that we have all at one time or another have faced in our life. And the first thing I'd like to show you this morning is in this rejection and hurt, Joseph dealt with jealousy. Joseph dealt with some good old-fashioned jealousy. Jealousy rears its ugly head at the most inopportune times. Jealousy over someone else's advancement. Jealousy over someone else's uh, maybe blessing that you didn't receive. And in Genesis chapter 37, in the beginning of the chapter, look in verses 3 and 4, where the Bible describes something that happened in Joseph's household. The Bible says in verse 3, Now Israel, that's Joseph's father, Jacob, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. Because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. What did Joseph do to deserve favoritism in the household? I'll tell you. 
he was born. What part did he play? Nothing else. We don't know if Joseph was early or Joseph was late. I don't know if it was a hard labor or an easy labor, but he was born. And because Jacob, his father Israel, was old, he decided to love Joseph more than all the other brethren, which is not right. It is not right. Listen, fathers, Israel, Jacob, Joseph's father, created an environment for jealousy. And parents, if we're not careful, we will create an environment for jealousy. Now, Joseph, he didn't do anything. It wasn't like he was the teacher's pet. He didn't bring an apple to his father every day just to earn this love. Just his father decided, I'm going to love Joseph more than the other boys and his daughter Dinah. I'm going to love Joseph and I'm going to make him a coat of many colors. A coat of significance, this coat was. A coat that showed the favoritism. Basically, when Joseph put this coat on, everyone in the household now knew that daddy loved him best. And I'm blessed to have wonderful parents. I'm one of seven kids. My parents were very good about this. We teased them. I teased them. I tell them, I'm not the favorite. All right, but only in jest. But maybe some of you have grown up in a household or have been part of a household where there was favoritism. And maybe it wasn't you. Maybe it seemed like an older sibling couldn't do anything wrong. There was an environment for jealousy. And we have to be careful, fathers and mothers, that we're not creating an environment for this. That's easy. I just tell my kids, I don't love any of you. Of course not. I love all of them. And they're all unique. They're all unique. My son Johnny, he uh, takes after his mother and is a little sarcastic. I still love him. No, of course he gets that from me. And James is unique to Johnny and Danielle. They're all unique. I, I think of the Bible verse, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but, but bring them up in the nurture and admission of the Lord. And just a little side note here. Dads, listen, don't create a harsh environment. It, this started with some jealousy that Jacob created. There was jealousy happening, and Jacob could have stopped this from happening. He was the author of it. Israel was the creator of this. Because he decided to show his favoritism, he created this whole, in a, in a sense, this whole scenario. There was some jealousy. There was an environment, but there was envy. There was envy. You know, sometimes we have envy at church. Oh boy, why do they get that? Sometimes with parents, it's why does their kid get that part in the Christmas play? Well, let me tell you, after 12 years in the school, come and ask me, I'll tell you why their kid gets that part in the Christmas play. But there's envy. How come they get to sing that and I don't get to sing and bind the pulpit? It was years ago we had someone singing special music and they wanted to be in the evening service because they thought that was the premier spot for special music. Like somehow we rate our services, right? You know, of all the spots of special music, there's the, there's the slot A, slot B, slot C, and oh, slot E. Woo, boy, no one wants that slot. Envy. Envy. Envy comes all around us. If we're not careful, we'll be guilty of envy. Why'd they get that blessing? Why'd they get that thing? A good person and his brothers were envious. Jealousy. When jealousy comes, how are you going to respond? I read the story from D.L. Moody. There was an eagle that was jealous of another eagle that could outfly him. And don't miss this, my friend. There is always somebody bigger, faster, better, more wealthy... Someone always is better than you until you come face to face with Jesus Christ. But he was jealous of this other eagle that could outfly him. And he saw a sportsman one day and said, I wish you could bring down that eagle. D.L. Moody told the story. He said, the sportsman replied, if I only had some more feathers, I could shoot down that eagle and then you could fly higher. Well, the eagle said, I have feathers. So he plucked a feather out of his wing and gave it to the sportsman and the sportsman shot an arrow but missed the higher flying eagle and he said oh but I need another feather and feather after feather and yet the sportsman continued to miss and miss the other eagle until eventually the envious eagle had pulled out so many feathers he could no 
longer fly. You see, when you're jealous, the only person you really hurt is yourself. But can I add to that? It also hurts to have people jealous at you. Because jealous people say hurtful things. They say hurtful things. And Joseph's brother, the Bible says, could not speak peaceably under him. They couldn't even say hello to him because of this jealousy, this intense jealousy, hurt and rejection. You see, Joseph didn't have the picture-perfect home and picture-perfect relationship with his 11 brothers, all right? I I wish he had, but he didn't have it. They wouldn't even talk to him. Can you imagine that being left out? We're going to go play catch. Reuben, let's go play catch. Simeon. Hey, hey, I want to play. Pick me, pick me. Joseph, get out of here. Won't even speak peaceably unto him. I read a story of two shopkeepers who are bitter rivals. The stores were directly across the street from each other, and they would spend each day keeping track of the other person's business. If one got a customer, he would smile and triumph and at his rival and vice versa. One night, an angel came to one of the shopkeepers in a dream. He said, I will give you anything you ask, but understand this, that businessman across the street will receive double. If you ask to be rich, you can be rich, but that man across the street will be twice as rich. If you ask to live long, just remember, he'll live twice as long. He said, what will you ask for? What is your desire? And the man frowned for a moment in his dream, the shopkeeper. He said, fine, here's my request. Strike me blind in one eye. Jealousy. Jealousy. I see jealousy and hurt and rejection in our life, and sometimes when it comes, we don't understand it. We didn't do anything to deserve it. And yet we're still hurt. If we're not careful, we can become bitter. But I see something else in this passage. If you would look down a few verses... If you look in verse number 5, the Bible says, And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it to his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose, and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood around about and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. Not only was there jealousy, I want you to point out this morning that there was misunderstanding. Joseph dreamed this dream, and he dreams two dreams where he's in the field and they're, and they're reaping the, 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 the sheaves. And all of a sudden his sheaf stands up, the other one's bowed down. They interpret the dream correctly. All right, they understand it correctly that in the dream at least, Joseph's going to be preeminent and everyone else will bow down to him. They interpret that correctly. His next dream uh, is he's, he's in, this, in the heavens and the sun, moon and the eleven stars bow down to his star, may obeisance to his star. They again interpret it correctly that, that Joseph is going to have a place of prominence. But what they didn't understand is what it meant. They kept on focusing on how it affected them. You see, we know the end of the story. At the end of the story, they're starving. At the end of the story, they don't have even enough food to continue to live. And Joseph will be the one who brings and supplies food for them. If they knew that, they wouldn't have argued back here. But all they could see, all they could see was that this guy was somehow going to be more important than they were going to be. They misunderstood what God was going to do. Someone once said that as a, as a young pastor, I shouldn't tell anyone else my dreams. Now, I don't mean the dreams I have at night. I don't like to hear those dreams in the first place. Please do not come and tell me them. This is what happens with dreams. Someone comes, oh, this was hilarious. Maybe you've had this happen. As they're telling you their hilarious dream, you sit there with that like confused look on your face. They end it this way. It seems like all the time. Oh, I guess you had to be there. I can't. It's in your head at night. I'm not there. So I don't want to hear your dreams, okay? What they meant by that is don't tell them your vision. Don't tell them the dreams that that you'd like to do as a pastor because because other pastors don't like to hear those things and they will crush your dreams. 
Well, I tend to be an idea guy, all right? It's just how I made, how God made me, and I've got ideas all of the time. Sometimes they're good, often they're terrible, all right? Uh, at home, sometimes my wife thinks I'm an idiot. That's usually what she thinks. Other times they work out. But Joseph, he took that now. There are people that still, that, that believe that God still speaks in, but he uses his word. But Joseph told these dreams and there was misunderstanding. Oh, oh really, Joseph? Rather than rejoicing with him, oh really? So you think you're going to be somebody, do you? Ha! Huh. You know what? We're going to hate you more. Once again, what did Joseph do to have this dream? I'll answer the question for you. Nothing. He fell asleep. So, so far, Joseph's brothers hate him because he was born and because he fell asleep and had a dream. You see, there's misunderstanding. Would, would God do that? They were so focused on themselves that they couldn't comprehend what God would do. They thought it was all about exaltation. They thought it was all about their servitude. They misunderstood what God was going to allow. All they saw was this last part, not knowing the process to get there. See, Joseph went through a lot of hurt to get to that point. Sometimes we look at someone else with jealousy and we misunderstand how they got there. We don't know the details. We just see the end and we don't like it. Misunderstanding. But then I noticed that we read this morning maliciousness. There was some maliciousness there. They had no regard for us. We read that passage this morning. Joseph starts to come and, and they say, look at this dreamer. Now we'll get him. We're going to kill him. Can you imagine that? Your own brothers, when you're coming up saying, listen, here he comes. We're just going to kill him. I can't even comprehend that. But it happened. And Reuben's sticking up for him saying, listen, don't do that. They initiate the confrontation. They're insensitive to his cries. They throw him in the pit and they sit down to eat bread. They don't even bother to skip lunch. They were so calloused. They're so selfish and so wicked. They conspire against their brother and then go have a sandwich. That's how malicious they were. They had no regard for the truth and no regard for morality. The Bible tells in another passage that Joseph cried and they were callous to his cries. Can you imagine being Joseph being tossed in the pit and crying out, you know, Reuben, Simeon, Gad, I'm your brother. Malicious. So how do you respond when there's hurt, jealousy, misunderstanding? For some, they look for a chance to get even. I will bide my time, and when the day comes, I will get you back. For a number of years, I refed girls soccer. I was refing a game over the other side of, the, uh, other side of town in the, the Hemlock area. And I was with a ref, and he told me this story. He said, J.D., the last game, I had just an interesting circumstance. It was a, early in the season. He said, the first play of the first game, a girl went down there to take a, a shot. And another girl, a defender, on the other team came and just slid tackle and wiped her off the field. Just took her out. Went over there and talked to her and said, listen, what are you doing? I mean, it wasn't that play. And this girl said this. She goes, that girl, last year, in a tournament game, slid tackle my sister, and I've been waiting to get her back. Now, we're talking nine months, ten months of time. But some people are guilty of that same thing. I will bide my time. And last year, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, and you just wait. You just wait because when the opportunity comes, I am going to get you back. Some people respond that way. Some people live in that spot and you could see how Joseph with the jealousy and misunderstanding and maliciousness, you could see how that could be an option in his mind. Sit there on the way to Egypt with the Midianites saying, Whoa, those boys, if I live through this, they will never, ever recover from what I'll do to them. Some people respond with revenge mind. Others respond with depression. 
My life's over. It's not fair. It's not fair that happened to me. What did I do to deserve this? Whatever did I do to make them all mad at me? Daddy made me a coat. Daddy loved me and I fell asleep and had a dream. What did I do? Well, you know what? I don't even care anymore. I don't even care. I don't care. I'm not going to please the Lord. I don't care about the, the God that my dad Jacob talked about because he did nothing for me. He got me sold on my way to Egypt. He put me in a family that I didn't want to be in. I never asked to be born in this family. In fact, I want a different family. Some people respond that way. But Joseph didn't do any of that, did he? Look in your Bibles in Genesis chapter 50. I think the key verse we've looked at each week for the whole life of Joseph. Joseph come back, comes back and he says this in, Joseph chapter, in Genesis chapter 50, verse 19 and 20. And Joseph said unto them, his brothers, Fear not, for am I in the place of God. But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. You see, in a big in spite of moment in Joseph's life, he could have gone one of two ways. He could have gone in the flesh, in his mind, in reactions, or he could have turned toward God. And you always, you and I always have the choice to follow God. The choice to say, is God really doing something? The answer is yes. Do you really think God can use this in my life at some point? The answer is yes. And why did God allow this? Well, maybe someday you'll find out. I don't have the blueprints for your life but I can trust the master architect. What did God do? He matured Joseph. He saved a country. And he got the glory. It's interesting though is sometimes we think that we're the only ones who face rejection. Hebrews tells us, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. And I can't help but think that this account of Joseph reminds me of someone else. When Joseph went to his brothers, he was sent by his father on a mission. I'm reminded of a man who came down from heaven who was sent on a mission by his father. Joseph was rejected by his brother, and the Bible tells me about Jesus in John chapter 1. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Joseph was sold and despised and rejected. Jesus was despised, sold, and killed. He is despised and rejected among men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. But Joseph ultimately became the savior in this situation. Ultimately, because Joseph was in Egypt, the family lived. The family had food. And because of Jesus Christ, you and I have salvation. In Matthew chapter 1, the angel comes to Joseph and he says, And thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. What I'm trying to say is, you can be a part of a bigger story. And you see the rejection and the jealousy and the misunderstanding and the pain. And you can choose either to focus on what God is and what He can do, or you can embrace that hurt. Samuel Brangle was a worker with the Salvation Army. One day as he passed a bar, some men threw a brick at his head. The aim was good, and he was in the hospital for 18 months in recovery. But during that time, he wrote a little book entitled, Helps to Holiness and thousands upon thousands of copies were published. After he was able to begin preaching again, people would often thank him for the book, and he would respond by saying, if there had been no little brick, there would have been no little book. He saved the brick. One day his wife presented him this brick. You know what verse she put on there? Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. But as for you... Ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. So my friend, you have a brick in your life? Maybe it's a block. Maybe it's a whole block wall. God can mean it for good. How will you respond? Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for your word this morning. Lord, thank you for the example of Joseph. Lord, the times in our life that we'll face rejection and hurt. Oh, God, we need your hand upon us. 
when we'll be tempted to respond in like manner. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to respond in faith to you. To know that you're doing something bigger than we see. What if you're here this morning with your heads bowed and eyes closed? And I wonder if you've experienced or maybe you are experiencing some pain and hurt, maybe rejection. Maybe you've been tempted to respond with bitterness, anger, a revenge mentality. My friend, can I encourage you to respond in faith? Respond in worship. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. I wonder if you're here this morning and say, Pastor, would you pray for me? As you spoke, God spoke to me. Something in my life that I have been tempted to or maybe even have responded to the wrong way. Maybe you're going through it right now. I would say, Pastor, would you pray for me that I'll respond in the right way? They meant it for evil, but I want to trust that God meant it for good. Who would say with that upraised hand, Pastor, pray for me this morning. God's touched me as you spoke. God spoke to me. Would you lift your hand up? Amen. 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 Hands all over. I wonder if you're here this morning and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. My friend, God loves you and Jesus died for you. In just a moment, we'll stand for the invitation. We'd love to open a Bible and show you how you can know for sure you're going to heaven. If you're online, we'd love for you to call us. We have folks standing by the phones right now. We'd love to, to uh, give you a scripture over the phone. One of you here this morning say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I've never trusted Christ as my Savior. I'm not sure I'd go to heaven if I died, but I'd like to be sure. I'll draw no more attention to you than did anyone else. Would you slip your hand up? I'm Pastor, I'm not sure. I've never trusted Christ, but I'd like to be sure. Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? Slip your hand up, slip back down. We'll see acknowledge that. If you're this morning like that, amen, I see that. Who else? Lord, I thank you for this time. Lord, those who have indicated that you spoke to them this morning, I pray that you'd help them. Or maybe they're going through a hurt. Maybe they have been through one. Or may they look to you and would you use it for good, that brick in their life, Lord, would you make a story, a book out of it. Or for the one who wants to trust you, Lord, would you help them? to come to you today and trust you as your Savior. Lord, bless the time of invitation now. We give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. As you stand to your feet, the heads bowed and eyes closed, encourage you if you want to come pray, to come pray up front. If you want someone to pray with you, we have folks who would be happy to, to pray with you. If you're not sure you're on your way to heaven, we'd love to have someone open a Bible and show you how you can know for sure. If God spoke to you, come do business with Him. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. It's a great song. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for what you're doing here, Lord. Thank you for working in people's lives and hearts. Lord, help us to 
trust you. It's so sweet to trust you. You're a tremendous master, and you're a master's touch. And take what we look at as a tragedy, as hurt. Lord, and you can do something wonderful. Lord, we love you. We give you the praise and honor for it in Jesus' name.